Well, everybody, I'm back and I am so excited. And I know what you're saying, Constance, you're always excited. Well, that's a good thing, right? It keeps me in the vibration of gratitude and joy and happiness. But today, if you have been struggling with addiction, stress, anxiety, depression, and you've just tried everything that you know, I believe that spirit has attracted you here so that you can receive exactly what you need. So uh, my very special guest is Mr. Bob Gardner. Uh, he's the foundation of the Freedom uh, Project, and he's a freedom specialist, which is a body-based approach to happiness. Anybody want happiness, health, and well-being. He has an amazing story. He is the author of the book Built for Freedom and host of the inspirational podcast Alive and Free. And one thing that he said that just sort of blew my mind, uh, and he said that freedom is a skill, not a pill. And I just said, okay, I'm getting ready to drop the mic on that. So I want you to open up your heart and open up your spirit to receive exactly what you need. So Bob, welcome to the Law of Attraction Radio Network. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, Constance. Should be a lot of fun. Yeah. So I know you got a story, but we need the short version today. Uh, as I said to you before I hit record, that I, I thanked him for his own story. You know, the spirit says sometimes what you think is your mess becomes your message. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about you and your story, and then we're going to teach people about freedom. Sounds good. The short, short, short version <laughs> is I'm the guy that messed everything up. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, as a young kid, uh, with a father in the military. So we moved around a lot. And I mm -hmm. often felt socially awkward, kind of outside of the friend groups and whatnot, had to constantly make new friends. Somewhere in there, I developed the idea that there was something wrong with me, that I didn't quite fit in, you know, like normal kids would do. And as a teenager, I discovered that pornography felt a lot better than trying to sort out social groups and things like that. So that began 18 years of using that as an escape, and then it eventually led to food and then eventually to some illegal, illegal drugs. And in the process, my um, my wife, who had endured it for eight years, finally said that she was done. And I don't blame her for that. I probably would have been done earlier if the if the roles had been reversed. And so I was I had been massively depressed, super suicidal, um, anxious. We, we had gone through bankruptcy. There'd be all kinds of struggles in the middle of this. And uh, then all of a sudden, I'm going to be alone. My kids are going to be gone. And I was staring down this sort of barrel of a gun, so to speak. Yeah. And I was like, I, I can't, I can't. I have to do something to change it. So I, I did everything I knew how to do. I had tried all the programs, the 12-step programs, you know, talking to therapists, reading, reading articles, all those different things. And, you know, I learned a lot. Um, but nothing was changing. Like I was still struggling with it. And the main idea was that I would be struggling with this for life. That's the main idea that you're going to manage it. You're going to cope with it. And maybe we can get better at it and reduce it. But in the end, you've got this problem and you're going to be there forever. And then one day I just had this, we could call it a vision, whatever it was. My mind went somewhere where I saw myself as a 90 year old still struggling with this. And I was like, no, I got to find a better way. So I threw away everything that I, had been taught that wasn't working. And I just started trying and experimenting with myself. What could I do to change this entire situation so I didn't have to struggle with it anymore? I felt like I had a lot of potential, a lot of things in life that I wanted to do. And I wasn't about to spend all that energy just coping with addiction or depression. And so uh, as a guinea pig, I went forth <laughs> and made some mistakes and ended up discovering that in the end, if you can retrain the body and its instincts for how it handles life and develop that skill, then happiness and health and well-being and freedom start to happen on their own. And it doesn't require willpower and you can spend the rest of your life doing things that you actually care about. 
we know as a therapist, I get you because I'm like, it could not be the will of God for folk to be in therapy and struggling. I'm like, there has to be higher ways. So, so talk about uh, um, your body based non sense approach to freedom. What does that look like? And what role does our body play for people who might be addicted, struggling like you have been, you did in the past and like I have been in the past? What does that look like? Yeah, a great question. So, uh, so it started with me with a simple question. Okay, I've been telling myself I'm addicted, or I've been to all these meetings and claiming I'm an addict. I've been saying I'm depressed. And the question I had to ask was like, what do I mean when I say that? What do I mean when I'm saying I'm addicted? I'm doing something with my body and it's creating a certain result. What do I mean when I say I'm depressed? Well, uh, well, I feel a certain thing in my body in certain areas. And that's how I know I'm depressed. If I didn't feel those things, I wouldn't know I was depressed. And so all of my attention started to focus on what is going on in my body. And then the question that arose was like, well, if I could just change how my body's behaving, would that get rid of the problem? And it turns out that over time, that worked. Now, in the beginning, I change it once and then the problem comes back. That's typical. <laughs> but as I trained my body to not to just behave differently and to respond to stimuli differently, triggers went away, all that other stuff. So if you think about it at a basic level, your body is the thing that qualifies you to be alive on the planet. <laughs> if you didn't have one, you wouldn't have these problems. And so I was like, okay, cool. Let me just go back to that and go, all right, if I feel these things and if this is the source of where the struggle is, let me retrain it as an instinct. And it turns out that neurologically speaking, your brain is not in touch with the outside world. And so it's gathering information only from your body to find out what's going on outside. And if your body's in this weird, uncomfortable space, then it doesn't matter how beautiful the day is. It has to go through that discomfort to get to your brain. So then the brain just looks at the world and feels miserable. Anybody who's, it's a beautiful day outside, but you feel miserable, this is what's happening. But if I change the body, and that means learning to move different, learning to breathe differently, learning how to stand differently and posture and things, learning how to use my voice in a different way. If I change what's going on in my body, including nutrition, by the way, there's tons of, tons of research about this, then what happens is even if it's a rainy day outside, that comes through this beautiful, wonderful feeling in the body. So the brain starts to experience life as beautiful, no matter what's going on. So that was the, that was the inroad. That was where I started. Let me make my body, this lens through which my brain sees the world, into something that is a beautiful, wonderful lens. And then all of a sudden, all these problems started going away. And you, you know, just before we uh, got on the call, I'm always five minutes early. And I said, I'm going to do my breathing. So I, I did my breathing because I had a very, I know I look, everybody who's watching this, I look cool and calm, but I've had a very busy day today. So I just sat in stillness. So, so does breathing, I heard you use that as just one example. Does that change your body? Is that changing our nervous system so that when I got on the call with you right now, I'm very calm and peaceful. Is that an, an, an example? Yeah, it is a perfect example. And there's a bunch of ways to, to use breathing. Um, so if you think about it, basically, your heart sits on your diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So if you're breathing and you're moving your diaphragm in a calm way, then you're calming your heart down. And if you calm your heart down, all the blood vessels that run out of your heart calm down. And suddenly the rest of your body's like, oh, dude, we're chill. On top of that, if you breathe effectively, all that stuff, you breathe it in, it goes through your lungs and right into your blood, and that goes to every cell. And so you actually change your body chemistry as well from the stressed out acid state to this more baseline alkaline state, which now is more effective for your body to run. So you change your chemistry, you change your nervous system, you change your overall tension patterns. Those who have hypertension, breathing is really helpful. All of that just from breathing. And it doesn't cost anything. You just sit there and breathe. Yeah, And, and so... What about moving our bodies, whatever that would look like for different people? So what would the, how would that impact addiction, anxiety, stress for somebody who maybe has tried all of the traditional stuff, but it hasn't worked? 
Yeah. So uh, when you look at the, the reason people go to coping behaviors, whether that's addiction or whether that's scrolling on their phone or looking mm -hmm. at anything else is because they're in some way, shape or form uncomfortable. You know, they're, they're, you know, something's happened and they're tight or they're tense or their breathing stopped or, you know, they're sitting in an uncomfortable position or they're bored or they're stressed and they don't like that situation. And so movement is a way to get rid of the discomfort in the body. Tension has built up. And if you move gently and if you move in a way that relaxes it, then that tension goes away. So that's why, this is why like age old wisdom, right? Go for a walk when you're a little bit upset, go for a walk. People move all the time. There's a lot of people that go to the gym and they work out or, or they go for a run or something and they find that they feel a lot better afterwards because they've started to work the tension out of their body. Now that tension, your brain associates everything going body with whatever was happening around it. And so the tensions you have in your body are related to all the memories you have of past traumas, of, of events in the past and whatnot. So letting go of tension actually starts to train your brain to let go of all of the memories and all the negativity that's happened in the past as well. Now, here's the caveat. If the movement is jerky and tense and something that builds more tension, it won't help you. So the key is to do whatever exercise you're doing or whatever movement you're doing in a way that doesn't stop your breathing because that'll build tension mm -hmm. and also that relaxes the rest of the system. So, uh, that takes a little bit of practice. I, you know, I learned a lot of martial arts type stuff, uh, in the past. And so we, we ended up doing a lot of just playful rough housing with a lot of the clientele and stuff. So they have a good time, they're laughing and in the middle of it, their body is letting go of all of the stuff that it's built up over year, over the years. So, you know, we've been taught that our spirit and our mind is king. So people say spirit, soul, body. Spirit is the dominant force. And then the last thing that aligns is our body. So, uh, uh, you know, what about our mind? What role does our mind play with this whole body-based approach? So what I've, what I've found... Okay. is that every thought you have, every emotion you have is a byproduct of or a result of the state your body is in. Wow. So if you like, for instance, if you're, if you're thinking about something, if I tell somebody, okay, I want you to think about this. They usually, they like roll their eyes, they put their hands in a position, they put their body someplace so that thoughts can emerge. And what I've started to notice is like, we've had people who've been struggling with lust, for instance, who are dealing with sexual addiction or something like that. And so I'm like, oh, you're in lust. Well, how do you know you're in lust? And they're like, oh, well, uh, their mind is fixated on something and their eyes are super hyper-focused. Their head is slightly jutted forward. Their breath is shallow. They feel this adrenaline rush through their system. You know, they're on high alert, this tingle in the skin. And I go, cool, well, why don't you hang upside down on the couch? And they change their body position. It's really hard for them to keep lusting because it is dependent on the state the body is in. And so... Um, it's a backwards approach from what most people think about. They always want yeah. to do this top down. Let me think first and then the body will follow. And it's, don't get me wrong. Sometimes that's very helpful. But what I've found more effective, if you want your happiness to be on autopilot, is to start with the body. And then you just discover that your thoughts don't grab you as much. And you can handle the thoughts a lot better, the recurring ones, if your body's already at ease. So so what I tend to try to, to teach people to do is like, let's train your body to be in a space that feels wonderful. And then the thoughts that emerge from that and the emotions that emerge from that, if they're troublesome at all, are a ton easier to deal with than, than already being uncomfortable and then do it. So I do body first and then we start to work, work on the mind. That is so interesting. That's why I wanted to interview you. I'm like, okay, this approach is so different. So share with us an experience of, you know, maybe somebody who's participated uh, in your program and how you use your approach to really radically change their lives. So, so yeah, let me, let me talk about Lee. Okay. He's hey, in the Lee. First <laughs> <laughs> he's in the first chapter of the book that I wrote my book mm -hmm. um his story's there so if people want to go back and, and read it further he he was born in the pro in the housing projects in in uh Chicago his mom had multiple affairs with all kinds of men you know 
and constantly in there. And he was abused sexually, emotionally, verbally, all kinds of things by his mom. She used to quote scripture at him while abusing him to try and get him to honor his mother, you know? Mm. And so like, really, he was there and he's like six foot 10 now. So he was a big kid and he had a strong faith. And so at 16, he's kicked out of the house because he kept challenging his mom for what she was doing, taken up by a pastor's family. And then for the next 30, 40 years was in counseling and he trained in narrative theory and suicide prevention training and got trained in some sort of counseling programs and whatnot, ended up speaking on a national platform about the effects of childhood sexual abuse, but the whole time was still struggling and coping with what was going on. He wasn't hopeless, but he wasn't hopeful that anything would ever change. So he came, he was in his fifties. Um, this was three, four years ago. Um, so he's in his 50, 50s. He's like, look, I don't want to get my hopes up. I don't want to try another program and have it not work like so many other things that have come. And I was like, look, you know, just start at home, start with these simple things. One day I was on the phone with him and I said, how are you feeling? He said, I'm, I'm depressed. And I said, are you depressed? I said, he said, yeah, I'm depressed. I said, well, how do you know you're depressed? Like, what is that feeling like? And he starts to describe, and I get him to be really clear on what he's feeling in his body. You know, stupid questions like, is your, are your nostrils depressed? You know, the back of your knees, are they feeling it? You know, what about your fingernails? Or do you feel it in the center of your body? And they're dumb questions. But, so it's <laughs> nice. They elicit a, a, a chuckle sometimes, but he's just like, no, I feel this kind of cloud over my head and low energy. And I was like, well, would you like to change it? And he goes, well, yeah. So I led him through some breathing and some movement. And within 10, 15 minutes, he felt wonderful. Where before that would have lasted for several weeks, unchallenged that I'm depressed. And so that's just the way it's going to be because we think that depression comes from the outside. So he starts to feel this. He comes to a retreat. Within four days, all the stuff around his mom, the trauma that he's been talking to counselors for, for over three decades, it evaporates because we hold him in that contained space for just for long enough challenging his body and all these things. I have him doing breathing and movement and rough housing. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about some of their struggles, but always pointing it back to the body. And at first he's confused and then he's angry and then he's upset. And then all of a sudden, all of it breaks free and he left after four days and none of that stuff from his past. But he knew it had happened. He didn't lose any of the wisdom, but now all the emotional reaction was gone. Amazing. So it's the feelings that have been housed in our body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you think about it, every emotion you have has like a chemistry that's produced, you know, different neurotransmitters, different whatnot. And if you're tensing around that, the more intense the situation is, that chemistry just gets stuck in the muscles. And so every time you move them, your brain's like, oh, yeah, I remember I'm feeling that thing. So in order to really clean them out, to move and breathe in such a way that you really flush the whole system, like you would a car, like a fuel injection mm -hmm. system or clean up the brake lines or something. When you clean out all the gunk, then what's left is things work swimmingly. And that's what that's what needed to happen for him. All that emotional content that his brain was like, I remember that chemistry. That's back when this happened. The chemistry goes, the brain now is like, well, I guess that's not happening anymore. I guess we'll move on. And so when you do that, in that practice in your body, your brain has to align with the new version of who you are in your body and said okay i know we've been programmed to do that but we're not doing that anymore is that is that what is happening yeah that's what seems like is what happening like if, if the way i see it the brain is not like the body the nervous system is not trying to waste energy and it takes a lot of energy to to feel depressed to feel anxious yeah. to, to to go through addictive behaviors and to go through the high and then the low that comes after it that's a lot of waste of energy. The brain and body don't want to do that. It's just that it's more painful for them to stay in how they feel. So they, they go through these things as a way to try and get rid of all that pain. But when you get rid of the pain at the, at the outset, the brain's like, shoot, we don't need to go through that place. And it's willing to let it go really fast. As an example, um, as, as a kid, I believed in Santa Claus. I hope I don't burst anybody's bubble here. Um, I think we all grown. <laughs> okay. I, I used to believe in Santa Claus and it felt very real to me. We lived in Germany for a period of time and they have their own St. Nicholas Day and the landlord had come all dressed up and sent all of these gifts to us and we had to come out of the corner of our eyes. So it just felt so real. 
And then when I found out that that was just the landlord, it's, it, I was a little disappointed for a second, but the, it was an instantaneous change. There was never a threat after that of me wanting to like watch over my shoulder for St. Nicholas or worried that Santa Claus was, was checking up on me. Like all the worries, all the fears, all the like controlling my behavior just to, all that went away because I knew that I knew the truth in like manner, the body, when you, you know, push on it and you move in certain ways and it discovers what it's holding, it doesn't like that. So the brain adjusts and gets the body to get rid of it. And then once it realizes, oh yeah, that was just a thing in the past. It's no longer happening right now. And I don't have to hold on to this anymore. It automatically and very quickly adapts to a new way of living. So, you know, as I quoted at the beginning, you said, it's a skill, not a pill. I'm like, man, mic drop. That needs to be somebody's mantra. Expound on that. Yeah. So many people on, you know, so many people, you, you know the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, in the beginning, wanted either an angel to come down from heaven or a special event to happen to show me that I was free. And that led me through a lot of pain and suffering because I was looking mm -hmm. to be saved. Uh, it was only when I turned the equation around and I realized, one, you know, I learned to walk. If you watch babies learning to walk, they get up on the table and they like teeter, teeter, and then they mm -hmm. fall on their bum and then they stop trying. And then they get up again and they teeter, teeter and fall on their bum. And then after a while they can stand and then they start taking steps and fall. And for a while they revert back to the old behavior. And by a while, I mean a few weeks. We're not talking months or years. And then at a certain point they catch the neck. And at that point in time, <laughs> They can reach things mom and dad wish they could never reach. They can <laughs> see things that you wish they couldn't see. And now they can run, they can move faster, and it's much more efficient. And it was just that skill, that knack that they were missing. They don't. Most of us don't sit here and walk around having to think about how to take our next step unless we've had some kind of injury or physical therapy is needed. So that is how I started to think about freedom. I was like, what if it's just a knack? What if it's just a skill set? And what if I can learn it as fast as I learn how to ride a bike or learn how to walk? And what if that opens up a whole new area of, of operation that I never even knew existed because I was so busy crawling my way through life? And so the skill set of freedom is not that you won't have negative thoughts, not that you won't have negative reactions to the world, but that the time frame at, in which you get stuck in those diminishes so small because the body has learned a certain muscle memory of how to get rid of them. Now, maybe one day they won't, they just won't come. I can certainly say from my own experience that many of the thoughts I used to have don't even show up anymore. Many of the feelings I used to have don't even show up anymore. And it's not because I'm willpowering my, it just, they just don't show up, but there are still some. And what I notice is they come and then my body handles them. Like I notice it, breathe, I move or whatever else. And I, and I become aware of it. I just look at him like, oh, that's cute. Look, depression has visited for a few seconds and then it goes away. Because you can handle any emotion in the world if it's only around for a second or two or 10 seconds or something like that. It's only when they stick around forever. But people pay money to go to a movie to be scared. You know, they go to these yeah. horror films and stuff because it's entertaining. And that's the way I wanted my emotional state to be and my mental state to be. That it could just be entertaining and then it leaves and I can move on with my life. So the skill set is just training the body to handle them so that they don't stick around very long. I love that. You know, so many people that I've interviewed talk about talks about energy and that your inner energy creates your manifestation. So uh, with your approach, or would you say people are changing their energy, their vibration, however you want to say it? Is that what, what is happening? I'm trying to get listeners to really get a full grasp on it, what that would look and feel like. Yeah, so I I tend to take a really sort of practical approach that's dead honest about what it is I'm experiencing. But the first book I wrote was about energy healing. And, uh, you know, I used to operate in that film, that field. And for a long time, you know, we use words like chakras and chi and stuff. And I, I had to get honest with myself and say, what do, what do I mean when I'm talking about that stuff? When I'm talking about energy? And what I could say is, that, that I feel sensations in my body, whether that's a prickle under the skin or a tingle or a buzz or a warmth or something like that. It's a sensation. Mm. And that when that 
So when you do this stuff, yes, those sensations change. And what I feel as happiness is this like, you know, when you open a soda pop and it has that little uh, fizz that runs mm -hmm, to the top, mm -hmm. you know, like imagine that in your whole body, like this effervescent little background in the back of the body. That's a sensation. And that wasn't there before. So if you want to talk about energy as just the sensations you feel in your body. Yes, that definitely changes because your nervous system produces a very different feeling for life. Now, a lot of people get confused about energy because they start saying, oh, this is my sexual energy and this is my mental energy, or this is emotional energy. And, and that starts to make people think that it's more complicated than it is. Sexual energy is just a sensation you feel in certain areas of your body. Emotional energy is a sensation you feel in other areas of your body. Mental energy is a sensation you feel in other areas of your body. When you can boil it down to just being a sensation, you then you're no longer stuck trying to transmute sexual energy or turn it into something else. You just move sensation around. And that's a lot easier and more simple to deal with. So in the end, that boils back down to breathing and movement, soft, gentle movement or bigger movement or anything like that. So I heard you mention willpower. And we know so many people have tried to use their willpower alone to make changes. In your thinking and approach, why doesn't willpower alone work? So that's a great question because I tried and failed at willpower. <laughs> <laughs> it makes two of us. <laughs> uh, willpower requires you to be awake and conscious and in control of your faculties. It requires that. But even the pH in your blood, as it moves away from the optimal place, your conscious control of your body changes. Hmm. And those, the, that pH has changed without your willpower. It's not like you and I are sitting there like, you know what? I feel like I should lower my pH at the moment. Hang on a second. And then we just kind of like mentally just, no, that doesn't happen. Uh, at least not from anyone that I know. And so the, the difficulty with willpower is that it relies on the body to be in a, in a good state for it to function at its best. Then on top of that, you only have 16 billion or so neurons in your in your neocortex, which is the area that allows you to be conscious and aware and reflective and think about stuff. But you got like 70 trillion cells in the body. And so 16 billion to 70 trillion is like a tiny, tiny amount that's trying to control the whole thing. And on top of that, you have brains in other areas than in your head. Every time there's a cluster of nerve cells, meaning at each vertebra, there's two clusters along each side of the vertebra. And then there's like nerve nodes in the heart and there's a whole bunch of nerves in your gut. Those aren't in the brain. And so, yeah, sure, your brain says something, but your body hasn't gotten the memo yet. And it's the body, it's the muscle memory that needs to change. It has to dawn on the body. In a sense, you have to like touch the flame for your hand to go, yeah, that's hot. And we're not going to do that anymore. Whereas the brain can sit there and be like, yeah, that flame, that, that flame is probably hot. We probably shouldn't do that. But it's just guessing. So willpower relies on all those guesses, whereas if you train the body, it relies on practical neurological feedback, which is how every animal with a nervous system has learned to determine if something is beneficial or not. So interesting. You know, somebody knew that I was uh, interviewing you today and I told them a little bit about your pro approach and they said, Ask him about food addiction so I don't have to go and get Ozempic. I'm just giving it to you straight like they said. So if somebody who might be addicted to sugar or overeating, once again, talk about that. How does your body-based approach work in a situation like that? Yeah. So what we do is we start, I start people with some basic processes to help them start to feel better on the daily. So how they wake up in the morning how they go to sleep at night. And then we start to work with that for, for a little bit. And then I start to work with them on identifying how they feel during the day. What I've noticed is not all the time, but many, many times a person who is struggling with food addictions, they're going to the food out of a habit. And that habit has come out of their body just feels in some way, shape or form negative, either low energy, depleted, uncomfortable, lots of tensions, pains in the body, or they're tired, or they're thinking about something, and it's draining the body a certain way, their posture's off. And that as they start to feel better, naturally, the cravings for those types of things start to go away. We had a lady just the other day came in for some, we do some deep tissue work with them, helping them retrain their nerves. And 
uh, she, my wife was doing the work with her and she left and she just mentioned like a week later, she said, wow, my cravings for alcohol have all but disappeared. Now, alcohol breaks down to a kind mm -hmm. of sugar in the body. And this was just like one hour of work. You know, my cravings for alcohol have all but disappeared. I'm not vaping anymore. And my mom says that she has her daughter back. All from just one hour of really deep work, retraining the nerves and getting the body to let go of all those unconscious tensions that are in the inside. So when you can handle the discomfort in the body, most of the cravings go away. Then the second piece of the puzzle is that we've just learned to look at food a certain way. I mean, you think about it, when you're born, you've just had your head squeezed like <laughs> your brain's been through the ringer, your heart's been pumping nobody's business. So there's a lot of sensation. Maybe it's not experienced quite as pain at the time, but babies are crying and the first thing we do is give them the breast or give them milk. So in the beginning, Never the body thought about learns, that. Yeah, the body learns that food is comfort, food is love, food is attention, food is care, food is all these different things. And that's helpful for a baby. And so when it's uncomfortable, it cries. When it, and it just learns to uh, approach food as an answer to all the discomfort on the inside. So the second piece of the puzzle is that we get to start to challenge that. Here's what I would recommend to your friend. Every time you eat, check how you feel in your body 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes later. If you feel more energized and more alive, that food is great for you. But if you don't, you got to start to go like, wow, I ate that food. That's what this food is doing to me. You start to build a wall of evidence in your mind that helps you see, oh, wow, this isn't mother's milk. This isn't just building mm -hmm. everything. This is actually not helpful for my system, not the way that I want to run. And then as that dawns on you, your body naturally wants something a little bit different. It'll take some learning for sure. But we've had people with, with food addictions and all kinds of things, their sugar cravings go down and whatnot to the extent that they help their body get more relaxed and more at ease. And then they start to track why they wanted to eat. You know, what was happening beforehand when they started eating? And then what is the effect of the food on them? You just do that for a couple of weeks. You'd be surprised. A lot of things, you, you find the desire to change a lot, grows really readily. So do you believe that unresolved childhood stuff is what drives people into addictions and stress and anxiety and all of the above. So it's possible, but I, I think the difficulty with that is that when we say unresolved childhood stuff, um, people start looking for their childhood stuff. Cool. And I had a good child. Yeah, I moved around a bunch. But I had a good childhood. My parents did a great job. They did the best they knew. They shared the best of what life had to offer. And granted, like every parent, they they didn't know how to operate in some situation. I mean, when your son is forging your name on his third grade paper, that's <laughs> Oh, Lord. So, you know, uh, I gave them a run for their money. Um, <laughs> that's but, funny. But, 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 but there's no... I didn't have any. So when people were like, oh, yeah, it's your unresolved childhood stuff. And I looked at it. And I was like, I don't have any. So that makes me worse because I'm broken and I don't have a reason to. Be. And that's the trouble of starting to talk about it that way. I got gotcha. you. Is that I, I would say probably 40% of the people I've worked with would look at their childhood and say it was it was a really good childhood. And so they feel worse for being the way that they are because they don't have anything to blame. So what I would recommend people do instead is it. Yes, childhood memories can arise. And there's a lot of people who have unresolved childhood stuff that's in their mind, you know, that just pops into their mind from time to time and their body used to. But what I would say is that in any given moment of time, the only thing you're suffering is how you feel in your body. Wow. That's it. Not what you, th you not what you think in with your mind. Yes. How you feel in your body. Because let's say you start thinking about some big thing that happened in your childhood. If your body doesn't react in a negative way, you're not suffering it. Wow, yeah. so interesting. What about the role of spirituality with your approach? Is I, that you know, integrated or how does that work? I've had a lot of people ask, like, where does faith fit in? Is this a faith-based program or where does God fit in? Um, there's so much of like religious language and stuff that's wrapped around addiction that's happened over the years because Absolutely. of both the programs and stuff. And I wanted to be able to help anybody. 
you know, whether they were atheist or Jewish or Hindu or, or Christian or Mormon or any of those. And so I took a lot of care to remove anything from what I'm teaching people, remove any talk of the spiritual side of things so that they could have their own spiritual practice. And then this could complement that because what I'm teaching them is this is how your mind and body work. And now if you believe that your body is created by God, well, then by and large, this is you studying the will of God, right? What, whatever your body and mind do, that's you studying his will made flesh, you know? And, uh, but if you don't, this is how your mind and body work. Either way, happiness and health and well-being can be had if you learn to operate the machinery correctly. So I, I took a lot of care to remove I, that. I noticed that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted for listeners to hear that. So once we get our body aligned, I, I can't think of another way to say it, then our mind and our thoughts will shift and change according yep. to how we have shifted our bodies. Yeah. And and I think anybody can can relate to this on some level. When somebody says, hey, just take a deep breath. And like, it just reminds you, oh yeah, that's right. I'm here. I can breathe different. Now we can operate it differently. So, so is breathing, I mean, I know it's always been the thing, but lately I've been seeing so much and hearing so much over the last couple of years on on the power of breathing and breath work. So is that like a new, not new, but are people just awakening to that? What are your thoughts on that? I'd say the person that made it most popular was Wim Hof. You know, the Iceman did all of mm -hmm. his uh, Guinness Book of World Records stuff. And so he, he was probably one of the first ones that took it out of the sort of uh, kind of vague energy world and took it to science and went to a doctor and had them measure his, you know, his blood and his heart rate and see what could happen. And they had, they injected him with E. coli and, and he got a mild headache for a bit where other people were getting massively sick and things like that. And he trained other people to do it. So that I think started it and it's taken a, a big trend. And, and I think it's become more and more popular as people are, are abandoning the sort of talk therapy approach because they realize that not that it's bad, but it's such a small part of human experience talk. And most of the experiences okay. we've been through are nonverbal. Like your body has a feeling that's not verbal. And so me putting a label on it doesn't help. And so it's becoming more popular. I'd say one of the things that's missed with breath work in general is that people are teaching it like it's a technique. Yeah. Instead of like recognizing that you're breathing all day long. And yeah, sure, doing these techniques does help a lot, but it's the way you breathe when you're chopping vegetables. It's the way you breathe when you get up from the couch. Those are the tiny little moments that either build stress in the body or that build ease in the body. And it's the same with your movements. If when you change the way that you move, it's that buildup that really all these other breathwork practices and meditation practices are trying to get rid of. And as a result, they're missing what those practices can lead, which is far more spiritual in nature. So powerful. Anything else you want to share about your, your program? I know you got retreats, but anything else that listeners can do or awaken to or begin to think about with your approach? Yeah, what I would suggest is I, the way I come at things is that there is nothing wrong with you. Oh, I love that. Been, I love that. And there never will be. That depression is a sign of good mental health. It is a way that your mind is trying to create a feeling so that it will motivate you to take action. And anxiety and addiction, they're just solutions that you've arrived at that have kept you alive. You have a 100% success rate at surviving everything that life love has thrown that. at you. Unless you're dead and listening to this, in which case, you know, hi, how's it going? <laughs> Um, and so, so, so there's nothing wrong with you. It's just that you've learned a muscle memory of a way to feel and a way to act and a way to be. And if you can learn that, you can learn something else. What entertains you trains you. So the question is, what will you entertain yourself with that builds a muscle memory of joy and happiness and freedom on autopilot? I love that. I mean, and just you sharing that just gives people so much hope. Because I think people, I, I don't think people are tired. They've, they've read every book. You know the deal. Yeah. And, and, and your program, I believe, offers hope. Your approach offers hope. And it's, 
quicker and it's not long term, if you know what I'm saying, like being in therapy forever and ever. So you do retreats. Tell listeners about your retreats. What would that look like for them and your website? Okay. Yeah. The website is thefreedomspecialist.com with a the at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and the retreats we run, these are five day. We have online programs and things that you can find there. Mm-hmm. But the retreats we run are really, uh, it's five days. Uh, and I, what I'm doing is I'm taking people through all of the stuff that you can't do at home on your own. Like the online programs and stuff in the book, these are things you can do at home on your own and already start to see a change. But in these environments, I get to take people from their story about what who they are and what their life is. And I get to help them kind of burn that story to the ground a bit and discover that they've got a world of possibility in front of them. We take them through, in the mornings, we work with really subtle movement and and vocalizations that actually release painkillers in the body that increase production of BDNF and help them actually change with neuroplasticity and help them change their behavioral patterns just from certain ways of using the voice and stuff. And then, then we work into some movement stuff in the middle of the day. We do breath work in the afternoon and then there's body work and stuff in the evening as well as a chance to work with us. And we take them through a series of experiences to help them kind of map, wow, my nerves can be stimulated in all these ways. And I just learned how to get rid of the reaction. Mm. And so like, it's a massive, like almost like a boot camp kind of, of training the body to let it go. And then they leave the other way, just like Lee did. All the pain's gone from all these past events. And now what do I do with my life? I've spent so much energy just hoping and waiting for people to disappoint me. Now I have all this energy. Wow. Now what do I do with, with my life? And I would rather people have that crisis than the crisis that they had that they came with. So, I love it. So, guys, go to his website. I've 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 been on your website, Bob, and uh, just read your book. Very very powerful. You guys need to get his book. And I love it because I've always said, healing, shifting, and transformation does not have to take a lifetime. Yes. And maybe 12 steps, and I'm a therapist, but just, yeah, I know I'm a different kind of therapist. And maybe the old way of doing things, there has to be different dimensions, different approaches, new ways of thinking and being that can happen quicker and faster in our lives. And so that's why I wanted to interview you, because I just love your approach. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's just, we got to work with the whole person. If you got to talk about it, great. But don't forget to all the rest of you. Yeah. Bob, you are the man. Uh, I appreciate you. He lives in Utah. Mm -hmm. I've never been there. And he's only been to uh, to our airport. People jokingly say, I've never been to Atlanta. But if you're going anywhere, you got to go through uh, the Atlanta airport. And so you guys, you see that there is hope and that spirit does have a way for you to be on. Do you call it uh, autopilot happiness and well-being? Yeah, happiness on autopilot. That's the goal. Yeah, I love that. So we're going to end the show like that. Everybody, you know, I'm saying more in 2024. Make a decision to create your best week. Bob, once again, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure.